Uh, Custer 1. Custer 2. Obviously, two are on it. Uh, Greenwood. Franklin. Manal. Dewar. All good. All right. Uh, French 1. French 2. All good. Uh, uh, Hammond 1. Hammond 2. Uh, Hayward 1. Hayward 2. All good. Clark Morgan. Alright, um, Rooster 1. Okay. Rooster 2. Alright guys, to start us off with a special presentation. So can we please give a warm party and welcome to Mr. Terry Donahue and his team from So this is Terry. I'm Joel Sendheim. I'm president of Norris Technologies. And Terry is actually the one that you should really be thanking because he was the one who was in the field day after day uh, working on the big array that's up uh, the hill. So he's the one who made this uh, all come to fruition. But I'm very pleased to be able to be talking to you today, especially on such a great sunny day about the uh, fantastic strides that CMS has made in terms of bringing solar. Um, it really uh, shows a great commitment on the part of you as a community in terms of adopting solar. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about uh, is that in doing these solar arrays now, there's really a multitude of benefits. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the environmental ones, which is what's driving a lot of it. It's a lot of why we all became involved in this, because there are real uh, immediate changes that we need to make to address uh, the uh, significant environmental challenges that we face, but there are real opportunities to address that. Um, one of the things that excites me is I actually uh, have a uh, PhD in applied physics, so does the co-founder of Norse Technologies. So we're really connected to the broad educational opportunities that come with these arrays. And one of the things that's exciting is that there's a lot that you can learn. And what's also neat is there's actually a tremendous amount of opportunities for people who want to become involved in uh, renewable technologies. There's the obvious kind of science and technology, but a lot of what gets these things built really requires a lot of different sort of skill sets. So if as you go forward, you're interested in renewable technology, but maybe you're thinking more on the policy policy side or on the financing side. There's all these different pieces that need to come together to build one of these arrays. And so there's a lot of uh, um, input that people can give. So for example, right now in New Hampshire, there's a big debate that's going on in terms of what the incentives are going to be uh, down, in, down, down in Concord. And so much more than sort of technology going forward in New Hampshire, it's going to be how those rules come out in terms of how much solar is adopted. So there's a lot of ways to get involved in renewable technology. But CMS has made an uh, enormous sort of commitment to really uh, make a big uh, adoption of renewable technology. What's exciting is that communities like CMS can really have a big impact. They're big enough to have like a large power load that we'll talk about, but they're also small enough that they can be decisive and act. And this is where you see a lot that's happening in this country uh, and the adoption of solar is from communities of this size. And what's really a win-win now is that the technology has come down so much in uh, cost, especially the panels, that not only can you uh, benefit in terms of going green with uh, environmental technology, but it's also financially beneficial. Um, so we do face significant dramatic challenges with respect to the environment. Um, and the ways in which those challenges manifest themselves really depend on uh, where you are. And some of the studies, um, so this is uh, from Irene. I don't know, some of you uh, um, teachers may remember when this happened. And uh, what's the plot that's shown on the upper right is that um, several models suggest that the changes in the environment locally in this area are actually going to manifest themselves with increased precipitation. And um, anecdotally, right, I mean, what, what's this spring been like, right? It's been very wet. And so there are studies that suggest that this, is, this type of sort of um, increased uh, wet weather is going to be potentially the increasing norm for this area. And this is really what you see. So as a, as a physicist, my background, I always think about if there are simple models for things. And um, when you take a system and you add more energy to it, what happens is you just get more volatility, you get more swings. And that's kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing more um, extreme weather events like this. Um, so the challenge is to, uh, how do we deal with that? So this is a plot. It's an organization 350.org. And it's a nice kind of summary because there's a lot of misinformation, disinformation that's sort of floating out there around climate change. So it's good to have some simple kind of clear facts. And so what this is, it's a plot of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere 
And 350 parts per million is sort of considered the safe level. And you can look back at this, you know, historically over uh, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, and there's been fluctuations, but that's always been near the peak. And what's happened dramatically recently is we sort of blasted past that point. And then the challenge now is sort of what are the paths back? And um, what's encouraging is that there are very significant real opportunities to come back. And one of the most important is uh, removing coal. So people talk about coal, clean coal, it's, there really isn't the option there. It's to sort of remove coal and then to look at other ways to, to green the grid. But what's really inspiring is that there are solutions and CMS is very much taking an active role in adopting that. So a terawatt, 15 terawatts is sort of the power that the world uses at any time. So I want to try and get a, a handle on like what uh, a terawatt is. So um, can someone think of like what a, what would be a, something you use in your everyday life that would be sort of like a, a kilowatt? A classroom? A classroom? Yeah, a classroom yeah, so all of those, so like a, like a, a bulb might be like 50 or 100 watts, so all of those might be like a kilowatt. Like a microwave might be like a, a kilowatt. Um, a hair dryer might be a, a kilowatt. So that's like a kilowatt. And so then you take, um, uh, uh, a thousand of those, you get uh, a megawatt, right? And so then when you have a megawatt, that's sort of uh, on the order of what the system that we have like up the field uh, produces, right? So then you take a thousand of those, then you get a gigawatt, right? And then you take a thousand of those, that's where you get a terawatt. And that's what the world uses sort of in any instant in terms of its amount of power, 15 terawatts. Enormous amount of power, but what's really inspiring is that at any given instant, the sun is bathing the earth with 86,000 terawatts, right? So there's really this enormous opportunity to capture energy and meet our needs. So there's different ways to slice it up. There's different ways to kind of look at it. One way is if you took 4% of the world's desert area took into account efficiencies and things like that, that would meet that number. So there really are opportunities. Uh, and as I was saying at the beginning, because of economics and because of a commitment to green energy, the, the U.S. is, is rapidly adopting uh, green energy. So this is the amount of uh, um, red plot is the cumulative capacity of solar that the U.S. has added to its grid. And it's now way more than coal on an annual basis, and it's comparable to natural gas, so that's new capacity. So as coal plants are retired, how are those replaced? A lot of them uh, are now with solar technology, so you can see it's around, total capacity around 14 uh, gigawatts. And a lot of that has come with sort of communities of this size making a commitment to adopt uh, green technology. A lot of it, as I said, has been driven by the dramatic decrease in prices of the underlying solar panels. So this is where it's this fun kind of overlap between the technology and the economics. And that's really, and this, you know, even as late as around 2008, 2010, the price per watt of a panel was still around $3. And people were like, there's just, we're kind of where we can get. And yet five years later, we're now under a dollar a watt. So it's really, a lot of what's driving this adoption is that economically it just makes sense. It's in many places the cheapest form of power that's available. And this has been plotted. And so the opportunities are really large. So this is sort of the, the employment opportunities that exist in directly kind of installing. It's great jobs for sort of, uh, people have been talking about how do you grow middle class jobs in, in this economy. These are actually those exact kind of jobs. Um, and right now it employs, solar employs, uh, twice as many people as coal and about the same number of people as natural gas, which is also great because going forward, part of this is kind of, is a, a dynamic that plays out in the political process. And so solar now has a, a strong seat at that table in terms of making sure that it can advocate for the opportunities that exist. Um, so as I said, my background uh, is in physics. Uh, so one of the things I love about this is there's actually great underlying uh, sort of science and technology behind it. Um, Becquerel and Einstein were sort of involved in some of the very early pieces. The core idea is just with, photo, with, with photovoltaic systems is basically you take light, 
convert that into electricity. And that's the core piece, and that's what Becquerel noted. And then Einstein, actually, some of his work was related to understanding the, the fundamental physics that's behind it. But there's a lot of fun uh, science and technology behind it. I won't get into uh, the details, but um, uh, Mr. Donahue, I know, had the f good fortune of leading a class with some of the sixth graders. Uh, was it just last week? Yep. Yep. Um, where we brought on an interactive display so you can see how the solar panels work. And when you get sort of up with them, you realize that it's actually some complicated physics at the background, but the engineering behind them, you can really kind of understand how it works. So, I mean, the core of it is basically you just shine light on the semiconductor material and you create a voltage across it. And because of that voltage, then you can, you know, light a bulb or drive a system or whatever. You can extract energy from the system. Basically, just the light gets converted into power. Um, so here is the, the solar system that uh, we installed with CMS uh, up the road, and it's fantastic. I mean, CMS with this very strongly demonstrated, and you should all feel really proud in terms of the commitment to taking effort or uh, action to um, improve the situation that we face with respect to climate change. And it's t this type of action when modeled, you know, community after community, is having a real dramatic impact in terms of changing the nature of the grid. So right now, uh, um, CMS, you, this array will produce uh, about 1.2 million kilowatt hours. So that's an hour of a kilowatt of power uh, on an annual basis. And the total uh, electric load for CMS is on the order of 1.8 million kilowatt hours. So this array matches about two-thirds of the total capacity or demand that CMS has. So it's a fantastic, uh, you know, many people are sort of putting on uh, houses, people are sort of trying to match their whole load, but many larger communities are doing sort of pieces, you know, smaller pieces. But CMS has made enormous strides uh, in terms of meeting a majority of its load, and there are now opportunities to uh, potentially capture that last bit, um, but there's also opportunities in terms of efficiencies and other pieces. So CMS is really, uh, and this is a sort of a demonstration in terms of what we're talking about, about the impact of this array over the lifetime of the system. Uh, about 25 million uh, pounds of CO2. Uh, it's the opportunity in terms of removing that from uh, the atmosphere. So if that same amount of power uh, was produced by traditional sources of, of energy, it would be over 25 million pounds of CO2. Similarly, it would be similar to um, over 3 million gallons of gasoline. So real impacts in terms of the challenges we face for the environmental tech. Um, what, what time is it? Okay. Um, so as I said, one of the things that uh, we really love about doing uh, Solar, and we've done it with a number of schools, is really these ongoing educational opportunities. So I encourage uh, teachers and students to reach out to us and engage with us, you know, similar to the um, uh, session that Terry taught. We love coming on campus and doing sessions. We have a, I'll show it on the side, this interactive display, which is a great way to get a feel for, get your hands on the technology, kind of like going to the Monshire Museum. How does this stuff work? So on this, there are two panels. In the middle, uh, there are inverters. So the panels produce what's called DC power, which means that the voltage doesn't change. Out of the outlet comes AC power. So the voltage is switching. So you need something that, that does that process. That's the black boxes at the bottom um, are the inverters. Uh, each one of those blocks is an actual solar cell, a solar wafer. And then you can see the wires that run up and down, sort of collect the, the charges on the top and the bottom. And, what, and there are displays at the top that show what the current is and what the voltage is. And when you multiply those two numbers together, that's where you get the power. And with this, you can kind of shade it. You can see how it all, the traces all work. Um, so it's a nice opportunity to get your hands on and sort of demystify the technology. Um, so we welcome the opportunity to work with uh, students and teachers to sort of dig deeper to it. On the previous slide, there's actually a lot of information that you can gain uh, online data, which is a lot of fun in terms of just seeing what the array is doing at a given time. But it's also a neat opportunity for sort of projects longer term in terms of keeping track of how the system is operating and how it varies over the course of the season. Um, but I think that I'm just about out of time, but I might have time for a couple questions if, if there might be any. Yeah. 
Can you comment on um, what Elon Musk unveiled? Have you had any, had any chance to look into what he's unveiling? Like the solar, like the, the roof shingles? The roof shingles and how they're different from yeah, so the roof systems um, are interesting. So there's the actual solar shingles, which people have been pursuing for uh, a little while. Um, they're lower uh, efficient, but they provide an interesting opportunity. It's, at the end of the day, it's all about cost. And this is why it's interesting with respect to silicon. About three or four years ago, there was a lot of different competing technologies in terms of uh, uh, PV materials. And some of those had higher efficiencies, meaning that of the light that shines, more of it came out as electricity. Silicon. Their efficiencies have been slowly climbing, 15%, now about 20%. Um, and, but the advantage that they have, and now silicon sort of dominates completely the market, is that they're just much, less, much lower cost. Um, so at the end of the day, what people care about is how much are you paying for a certain amount of power. Um, so the shingles have an interesting opportunity, even if they're lower uh, efficiency, if they can be uh, lower cost. Uh, the other piece that they've done, which is interesting, and this is, comes back to sort of adoption of solar, is, and what Tesla does very well, is they're aware of the aesthetics. And they're sort of very much sort of confronting, I mean, you look at Tesla cars, right? They understand the marketing side of this, and they understand the hesitation that some people have. I actually am fine, I actually like the way panels look, I think it sort of demonstrates a commitment, but it does limit the market. And so what they're looking at very closely is like, how can you seamlessly integrate these into roof structures so that people um, essentially don't even notice them? That's a good question. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so each panel, uh, a panel, a typical panel is maybe around uh, 300 watts. That's how it's rated. So that would be the amount of power that it would output under full sun. And um, panels now are on the order of, let's just say for, uh, um, let's say two thirds, 66 cents per watt. So then that means each panel will be around uh, uh, $200. Um, but it's a great question because not that long ago, that same panel cost, you know, $5 a watt. So that same panel that now costs $200 a watt would cost $1,500, right? Um, sorry, each panel would, would have cost $200. And now that same panel is going to cost 15, I mean, sorry, used to cost $1,500 and now cost $200. So you multiply that over the course of, a, of over a whole field, you can see how previously, it would have been prohibitively expensive for many people to be able to do it, and now the economics just work. But it's a good question. Yeah, so when you look at it, it's funny, because it's cheap enough now that we get ones when we do a big field that get kind of dinged, and they look fine, but they don't work, and we use them like to make tabletops. And they're actually less expensive than you know buying a nice sort of wooden table. Um, so that's our sideline is gonna be solar furniture. Um, any more other questions? It's a great question. Yep. Yep. So it's a great question. The way people kind of look at that is they call it sort of a lifetime analysis. Like, what's the cost of building the panel, shipping the panel, installing the panel, all of that in terms of an environmental cost? And one way you try and quantify that is how long does it take for the operation of the panel in terms of its, its carbon offset? to offset the amount of carbon that was used or produced to bring the panel there. So it's about, because of the lower cost and more efficiencies with the new panels, it's about a year, year and a half before an operating uh, system or an operating panel will have offset the lifetime um, environmental sort of cost associated with its production and installation. It's a good question, though, because for any of these sort of technologies, when you talk about things like batteries are a great one, everyone's talking about batteries as this uh, storage is very important now. People are looking at uh, how do you store this power, um, and batteries are sort of at the forefront now, but a lithium-ion batteries is actually, there's a fair amount of toxic chemicals associated with it, so if you really look at it holistically, it's not necessarily a great solution. That's a good question. I don't know if we have time for... Uh, thank you, Mr. Stan Hyman, uh, Norwich Technology. Thank you. Now, Mr. Wendick and Ms. Rundell are going to come up and talk about their Europe. Can you 